Will China come for Serbia's lithium and create a new war of resources? Now, Serbia has a large reserve of lithium, but they are not mining it yet. The president says they just might, and environmentalists are freaking out. Ukraine has lithium, incidentally. They are not mining it either. So you see why we might be making this connection. Lithium reserve, possibility for war. Am I making a connection or am I not? Uh, we have a guest today, Nick Stankovic. He joins us today and he's an expert in Asian politics and also a Serbian who has great context all the time on X. This is his first time on Redacted. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for inviting me. Okay, so why do you say that Europe might be freaking out about Serbia's lithium? Well, it goes, um, um, it's connected to the whole competition with China, especially uh, in the auto industry and batteries. And China is really ahead of the game in front of everybody. It's a little bit of a less of an issue in the United States because U.S. has a lot of oil um, and is not, necessarily so excited about electric vehicles but of course germany is a is a huge auto producer and china has just become the number one exporter of vehicles in the world bypassing germany and also last year japan so china is now number one exporter of vehicles and most of it is now becoming evs and china is also way ahead of everybody in batteries and germany is um kind of freaking out as is japan as well um because they're behind the curve and Part of that is, of course, that even if Germany catches up on some of the uh, uh, EV tech, there's the battery part where also China is dominant. And so Europe is trying to find alternate sources of specifically lithium. Um, and there's been a fine in Serbia for it's actually been found in 2004. So it's been a while. But um, it's sort of been stopped because of environmental concerns, but it's now becoming hot again, as um, especially this, this, this sort of shock of, of China taking over um, in the automotive industry and batteries. Now, do you think the Serbian people want it because it could be such a boon for their economy? Or is, is it just a matter of, uh, much like in Alaska, we have oil gas reserves that have been not mined litigated up to the teeth and all of those people in those communities say we want this we want these jobs uh is that similar to what's happening in serbia no it's actually very different it's actually very different and i think most of the people in serbia do not want it i would say probably two-thirds and it's it's very it's not even political in terms of you know the the, the party in power and the opposition i think it's actually quite universal that even some even most of the people who are uh, voting, for example, for, for the, the ruling party, which is his party, are against it. And mostly because uh, people in Serbia just don't see the value. Uh, there's obviously going to be an environmental damage. I mean, that's just sort of a given. But, uh, you know, the number of jobs and the benefits for Serbia don't seem to be very large, at least for the people, right? I mean, the, the company, Rio, it's the, Rio Tinto is the company and they're the global biggest global mining company. They're looking to exp uh, exploit it and they will obviously make money. The state will make the estimate right now is that they would make maybe a hundred million dollars a year, which even for Serbia is not a lot of money. You know, that would sort of go into the state budget, which really wouldn't make a lot of things. And there's, they're saying it's about 2000 jobs, which is, you know, okay, but it's not transformational for Serbia. So one of the things that, that, that Bucic I think is trying to do, and he has said, so he's trying to, uh, make sure that at least it's not just the lithium that gets exported, but that Serbia also gets some factories to actually make batteries and so that there's a little bit more value add and there's a little bit more that stays in Serbia of the profit of that. But I don't think that's really quite on the books just yet. So um, it's kind of up in the air. It's very unpopular, but there's a lot of pressure from Europe, um, from Germany, political pressure as well on Serbia and on, on, on President Vucic. And, and, you know, so I, I think it's a very hot issue. I don't think it's going to happen because the people are so against it. I think it's, you know, Vucic yeah. had to stop it before elections. Interesting. Now, 
Europe loves to point fingers at China as a cautionary tale. They're doing things wrong, but they still are beneficiaries of Chinese imports. I'd like to ask you about the news this week that China discovered one of the world's largest metamorphic rock oil fields. That means that China now has another massive source of oil and gas and will be less dependent on Russia and other countries. So is this a boon for China and other BRICS nations that then the West is going to have to look down their nose at and say something to poo-poo it, for lack of a better term. Well, China is one of the one of the biggest producers of oil by itself, but it also uses a lot, and so it has to import oil. This new find, I would have to look at the numbers, how much of the gap it closes. But China is going through a major, major uh, uh, energy transformation. They're uh, really a big investors in, in solar panels and wind, wind energy. They now actually produce more electricity from renewable sources. This is solar, wind, and hydro than the United States uses a year. So all of the United States electricity, that amount is now produced by China from renewable sources. The other half, unfortunately, is the other half, unfortunately, is coal. So, um, but China is also a huge beneficiary of, or is going to be. It's it's in the works. It hasn't really started yet. Uh, of this, you know, Europe giving up all this natural gas. So that's going to come to China now. China's going to take it over. They love it because they're going to get it, you know, all that cheap gas that used to go to Europe. Now it's going to come to China. They just have to build the pipes. They can't build the pipes fast enough from, from, from Russia. So China is in, in, a, in a very good position um, and is going through a huge energy transformation. They're trying to obviously lower their coal dependency um, and dependency also on imports. So um, China is in a pretty good place. And also, I mentioned to you before we started that... Um, China's gasoline, petrol, is going to peak either this year or next year because of their switch to a lot of the uh, uh, the EVs, mm -hmm. right? And um, so the petrol use, uh, gasoline, is actually going to peak this year, next year, one of these years. It's going to peak, and then supposedly it's going to start going down. So they are really trying to... Um, um, I think for China, it's really a national security issue. They they just want to be less dependent on everybody. Right. right. So one of the things when I hear environmentalists say, oh, we need to stop China from polluting the earth. And I say to them, well, how come your country got to peak in their emissions, but China can't? That's actually kind of a racist thing to say. Um, so, right. you know, China has been signaling for the last few years, they are peaking at certain types of emission type transportation and uh, energy use. Um, now, you mentioned also real estate, that China may have peaked in real estate. I want to ask you about this hilarious 60 Minutes piece over the weekend talking about how China is just, they're screwed, was the whole, <laughs> the whole purpose of the piece. Well, well, look, so, so just, to, just to, I mean, I, I actually, I only watched uh, uh, some segments of, of the 60 Minutes. I haven't watched the whole thing, but I know the story, of course, because it's been around for so long. I, I actually, I bought and sold property in China, so I, I'm very familiar with the situation. Um, I'm very familiar with the sort of this, this ghost city story that keeps, keeps sort of popping up. Uh, people do not understand how China builds. I live in what used to be uh, a ghost city, and now it's a two or three million person part of town. So they, they just go in and they just build a lot of things. And if you go there, you know, while it's being built or while people still haven't moved in, it really looks like a ghost go city. And then, you know, five or six years later, China is a country of 1.4 billion people. And so they've, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago, they lived in, you know, there's a lot of it was, you know, old buildings and slums and so on. So all of that was raised and all of these new buildings came out. So a lot was built. However, there, there is something to the truth. Uh, there is something to the story that it has peaked because if you just look at the number of vacant apartments and the number of people, China still has to urbanize. China is 66% urbanized, US is 75. Okay. So there's still about 100 million people, Chinese people that, that will move to the cities. And so some of these empty apartments will definitely get filled up. Now, you know, there's the market and the price might drop and all that. That's that that will happen for sure. But they will get filled up. I mean, they're not going to be raised. So uh, but even with that, you know, the amount of real estate that's been built is kind of, you know, there there's obviously going to be some replacement. Some things are going to be torn down, new buildings built, but they cannot continue building like they have for the past 30 years. That is a fact.
Sure. So but the West said then the question about is Dubai as well. Dubai, oh, they overbuilt. No one wants that. No one cares. That's clearly not the case. Um, it's a growing pain. Right. And then, but one of the things about, you know, for China, it's going to be, you know, I mean, the building is not going to stop, but it's, mm -hmm. it definitely has to go down in terms of it, it, the way the speed. The thing is, at some point, it's going to, they have to transform the, there's a lot of vested interest, you know, real estate companies, investment companies, you know, construction companies, these have to be moved to do something else in the economy. And that won't necessarily be easy, right? That takes, you know, three, four, five, ten 10 years to sort of clear itself up. And that's going to be a period of, of maybe some, you know, economic problems in that sector. So there's some, there's some truth to the story, but a lot of these China stories, unfortunately get, exaggerated and you know the impact and it's obviously going to be government help and the government's going to step in you know bailouts and companies and and and, and people so i'm not too worried right so one of the another thing that was announced just this week was the russian finance ministry said that it's working on a BRICS bridge uh multi-sided payment platform so we're looking at who will be a cooperative with china China is a founding mem member of BRICS, so this would be a BRICS currency. The United States has sanctioned their way out of this, right? Or do you see this as a BRICS currency or maybe not? Um, so that's been talked a lot, and I don't think that's quite on the books, at least not in the way I think a lot of people imagine it as sort of like a euro or like a BRICS coin. Um, I think if, if it happens at all, it will be probably just sort of between central banks, sort of a, a clearing currency, like a basket currency that will only be for the banks. It won't be for people to use around right. if that happens at all. But I think, I think more, the conversation now is more along the lines of, uh, you know, currency swaps between central banks and trade in local currencies. So, you know, so one of the news that I saw was that Russia was going to start uh, uh, taking out loans in Chinese yuan, which of course they can't really take them in dollars anymore or euros. So they sort of have to, but, but they're going to start doing that. And I think some other BRICS countries going to, are going to start doing that. And then they can use that, those UN to buy other things from other BRICS countries because, um, the country, the receiving countries will be able to use them, right? They can always use those UN to go and buy stuff from China, which everybody buys stuff from China anyway. So there's going to be, um, uh, you know, essentially it's, it's de-dollarization and replacement of the dollar for, some of the trade, uh, most of the trade, or, you know, it, I mean, a dollar is never going to go to zero, right? But it's going to go down from, you know, 90% to, I don't know, you know, much lower than that. Um, so I think that's, that's definitely happening. And it's sort of definitely been sped up by <laughs> the sanctions on Russia, right? So some, Russia was sanctioned. So, I mean, all of this was probably going to happen anyway over, you know, 10 years or 15 or 20 years, who knows? But because of everything that happened, now it's happening in, in within you know three, four, five years. So I think that's um, going to be um, uh, quite a change. And of course, it's not going to be just BRICS, but other countries that are not necessarily members, of, like Serbia, for example, are, is, you know might eventually plug into some of those financial uh, systems. In addition to you know being being plugged into the Western, you know, some of the countries that are not necessarily members of BRICS will be also participating in them. Right. Yeah, that's great context. Okay, well, thank you for those explanations. I really appreciate it. I've always been looking forward to speaking with you. Again, you can follow Nick on X. He has great context there. Um, and thank you for coming on Redacted. I hope you come back another time for this great context. I hope so too. Great talking to you. I really hope you enjoyed watching this video. You know, YouTube thinks that you'll actually like this next video right here. It's personalized based on your own viewing habits. So if you watch the video, please leave a comment. Let us know what you think about it. And we will see you next time, everyone.